Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Noach, which focuses on God's reset of creation through the Great Flood. The portion is named for the righteous Noah, to whom God assigned the task of preserving a remnant of all life aboard the ark and restarting life on earth after the flood. In chapter 6 of Parshat Bereshit last week, we learned, And God saw that the evil of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. And God regretted that he had made man upon the earth, and he became grieved in his heart. And God said, I will blot out man whom I created from upon the face of the earth, from man to cattle to creeping things to the fowl of the heavens, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. With these words, Torah testifies to a dramatic shift and a transformation between the promise of creation, at the conclusion of which God had declared that everything he had created was very good, and the sharp descent from the heights of that divine affirmation of very good to the depths of divine disappointment. This dissonance bears witness to an irreparable rupture between the original harmony of creation and the sorrow of its corruption. By Noah's time, Humanity had descended to such a level of wickedness that the earth was filled with Hamas, a word that can be best translated as violent robbery. The earth itself was deeply permeated by evil, and man's depravity was so extreme that he literally infected all life forms on earth, and the whole world became corrupted. People no longer valued life or justice, leading to the widespread moral decay that ultimately triggered the divine decision to cleanse the world with the flood. But how did it come down to this? Isn't it, isn't it astounding that in a mere 10 generations from Adam to Noah, humanity had sunk so low, so far, as to be considered unredeemable by the Creator himself? The great sage Maimonides, known as the Rambam, explains the deterioration of humanity's moral fabric in terms of the slow but steady creeping influence of idolatry over the generations. Writing in his classic Mishnah Torah, in the section of Laws Concerning Idolatry, Maimonides describes the moral decline of humanity as being a result of the gradual but persistent spread of idolatry in the world. He explains that idolatry didn't emerge suddenly, but evolved over generations, influencing human behavior and eroding the moral fabric of society. This degeneration led to the complete debasement of man and to the divestment of the divine image in which man was created, ultimately leading to God's decision to bring the flood during Noah's time. To understand how things got so bad, we need to know the backstory. In the beginning, Adam had direct communication with God, and his descendants still retained a sense of God's presence in the world. Those early generations recognized and acknowledged the, ex the existence of the one God who created and governs the universe. They received this tradition directly from Adam. But with each passing generation, this consciousness became more dimmed, more diminished. Over time, people began to misunderstand God's relationship to creation. According to Maimonides, it started innocently enough. People reasoned that if God created, for example, the luminaries, then respect and honor should be given to the sun and the moon and the stars because they're God's creations and intermediaries for the sustenance of the world. Over time, this reverence for multiple natural forces morphed into full-blown worship of these forces as gods themselves. People started making idols, believing that the worship of these images would bring blessings. This shift, the great sage maintains, marked the first step in humanity's falling away from the connection with the one true God. It led, disastrously, to a belief in a universe being controlled by multiple forces. But open up your heart, because here is the thing that should matter the most to us. Once idolatry took root, it had a profound impact on human behavior and morality. As humanity distanced itself from God, it became more materialistic and egocentric, pursuing only pleasure and power. This shift caused people to see themselves as the center of the universe, and they used creation for selfish ends with no sense of accountability to a higher power. They neglected the world's potential for holiness, and they reduced life to base materialism, Maimonides stresses the important idea that idolatry, idolatry is not simply a mistaken belief about the nature of divinity. It brings with it a breakdown in moral and ethical behavior. 
The deliberate denial of the reality of the Creator, which is what the concept of idolatry is really all about, leads people away from the values of justice, truth, and righteousness that are central to monotheistic belief, and that plunges them into chaos. Idolatry, whether in its ancient or in a modern form, is naturally accompanied by grievous moral sins such as murder, theft, and sexual immorality. These sins, all manifestations of utter greed and selfishness, go hand in hand with a fragmented view of the universe as being controlled by multiple forces. In other words, the lack of one God consciousness leads to the spread of idolatry, which in turn leads to moral corruption. Open up your heart in the deepest way. The progression went like this. As people moved further from the worship of the true God, they lost their sense of accountability to a higher moral law. Instead of serving a God who demands righteousness and compassion, instead of seeking to deepen their relationship with the God who created them in His image, they worshipped gods that they created in their own image. And they began to serve idols that reflected human desires and vices and that gave them license to fulfill these desires. As a result, selfishness, cruelty, and moral corruption became rampant. This process of moral degradation didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual decline over generations, and as each subsequent generation embraced the idolatrous, practice, idolatrous practices of the one before it, the moral standards of humanity continued to steadily erode. The progression of this generational slide from Adam to Noah saw each generation sinking further into violence, sexual immorality, and lawlessness. And the Talmud comments that in the generation of the flood, theft, violence, and immorality became so rampant and accepted that it was no longer seen as wrong. This normalization of sin created a society that was beyond redemption. This is what Torah refers to when it states, the inclination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil all the time. People were so consumed by their own desires and impulses that they no longer had any moral compass. And remember, God didn't resort to the flood immediately. He gave humanity time to repent. Midrash describes how Noah, during the 120 years he was building the ark, he was constantly warning people of the impending punishment and urging them to change their ways. Despite these warnings, people persisted in their corrupt behavior. It was this persistence to cling to evil which made humanity irredeemable. When people become so entrenched in their ways that they cannot, they cannot even conceive of changing, then they're beyond the possibility of repentance. The generation of the flood had corrupted not just their actions, but their very essence. Their desires and inclinations and thoughts were only evil all the time, leaving no room for repentance. There's good reason why Torah is full of warnings about idolatry. This is no ancient problem, but a very contemporary one. What we're seeing from all of this is that idolatry is not simply a matter of a mistaken belief. It's about what kind of society those beliefs produce. When people believe in a transcendent God who demands justice and compassion, they create a society based on those values. When they believe in idols, and an idol is not necessarily a statue that one bows down to it, there are many things today that can be worshipped as idols. When society believes in idols that demand nothing but offerings and flattery, society becomes corrupt and self-serving. Torah is teaching us here that there is a deep connection between what people believe about God and how they behave. Belief in a just and moral God fosters a just and moral society. Denial of God leads to ethical decay. But now open up your heart deeper still. Torah tells us that Hashem saw the wickedness of man, had heartfelt sadness, and regretted having created man. What does this mean? Was omniscient God surprised at this turn of events as if he didn't see it coming? And God is not a man. How could he experience sadness and regret? This is the deepest of the deep, because what Torah describes as God's disappointment with humanity conveys the most profound lesson. These expressions of divine disappointment and regret are not simply anthropomorphisms, but are concepts that are rooted in the complex relationship between divine compassion for the profound moral failure of humanity and human purpose and the potential for spiritual growth. The concept of regret in this context is not so much that God regretted creation itself, but rather he regretted the way humanity exercised its free will, turning to violence and immorality and corruption. He regretted human failure 
to uphold moral responsibility. But people did not merely commit acts of violence or corruption. They also turned their hearts away from their divine purpose in a self-imposed estrangement from their own higher calling. In severing this connection, they lost the awareness of God's presence in their lives, leading to a world devoid of holiness. This is what necessitated a reset. In this light, we can understand the flood as a purification process, restoring the world's latent holiness and allowing for a renewed opportunity for humanity to fulfill its purpose. God's disappointment was a response to humanity's failure to elevate the world. The Midrash offers an analogy, comparing God to a, a potter who makes a pot, only to find it defective. Just as a potter can reshape the clay, so too God could remake his creation. And this analogy addresses the issue of God's omniscience by illustrating that just as a potter anticipates the possibility of failure, God anticipated humanity's potential for corruption, but he gave them free will nonetheless. But you know, ever since the garden, it's all about free will. Indeed, last week's opening Torah portion of Rishit emphasized that human beings are created with the ability to choose between good and evil. Free will is both humanity's greatest gift and its greatest challenge. Each person has a divine spark within them, a unique potential for spiritual greatness. But when we forget our divine purpose, we descend into the all-consuming corruption of self-centered materialism and we separate ourselves from the higher spiritual ideals that underpin the world. God was disappointed, so to speak, that humanity failed to live up to its potential for holiness. This was not anger over humanity's fall into irredeemable corruption, but rather a sorrow that his creation did not achieve the fullness of its potential. Yes, God is all-knowing, but he allows space for human freedom and moral responsibility, and his disappointment reflects the chasm between what humanity could be and what it became. God's justice is always tempered with mercy, and thus the flood was a manifestation of both judgment and compassion. Judgment for the failure to actualize divine potential, and compassion in allowing the world a fresh start to try again. Painful as it was, the flood brought salvation and rebirth for humanity as a whole through the righteous Noah, whose survival would give the world another chance. It provided a new foundation for future generations to reconnect with God. In this sense, God's disappointment serves as a hidden act of kindness, ensuring that humanity's true purpose is not permanently lost. The flood actually reflected God's optimism, as it were, in humanity's capacity to change, coupled with his hope that, given another chance, people might choose to take responsibility. It was an invitation, it was a challenge to humanity to live up to its divine potential. The Holy Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Aberdichev sees God's disappointment as akin to the loving disappointment of a parent who knows their child's potential and laments seeing them fall short. So this is good news. God doesn't give up on humanity. He harbors the hope that humans can change, as seen in his covenant of the rainbow, which reflects the divine commitment to sustaining creation despite human failings. So up now be hard, deeper than ever before. God endowed man, each one of us, with the ability to overcome our base inclinations. This Torah portion of Noah offers a profound lesson in understanding that even divine retribution is an opportunity for growth and alignment with divine compassion, even when it comes in the guise of judgment. In our day as well, Hashem's sorrow is still over humanity's choice to pursue their lower nature rather than strive for holiness. Yet he continues to believe in us and in the enduring possibility of our return, understanding our weaknesses and shortcomings with compassion, knowing that while we may falter, we have the divine spark within us and the capacity to rise above and fulfill our higher selves. If only we believed in ourselves, rec recognizing and embracing our divine potential, each of us with our own unique purpose and inherent holiness. Every positive action we take in this world has the potential to reveal holiness and to align with God's vision for the world, making even simple acts part of a greater spiritual mission. By seeking to infuse holiness into our daily lives, by connecting with the divine spark within ourselves and within all creation, we take part in God's vision for the world and the fulfillment of the mission of humanity.